Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Many of you know this mantra but maybe some of you don't. So we'll chant one beautiful mantra spoken by Prahlad Maharaj. It's actually mentioned in the fifth canto. And by chanting this mantra, one becomes fearless. <laughs> we'll do it responsive. Om Namo Bhagavate Narasringhaya Namas, Namas, Teja, Teja, Teja Se, Teja Se, Avir, Avir Bhava, Rajanaka, Rajadamstra, Kamasayan, Radaya Radaya, Tamo, Grasa Grasa, Om, Om Shra Shwaha Abayamatmayam Buyasta Om, Om Shram It's from the uh, fifth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. Lord Maharaj chants this beautiful mantra. He's praying. What is he praying for? He's not praying for anything material. He's praying, please, my dear Lord, Braja Naka Braja Stumstra. Naka means nails and Dumstra means teeth. You have very strong and very powerful vicious teeth, so enter into our heart and rip apart that little Rani Kashi Poo that keeps running around in our heart and keeps telling us what not to do. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's a very serious and offering a prayer from the heart from Prahlad Maharaj, really begging the Lord, please, we are lost in this material world only by your mercy can we become fearless in this struggle for the practice of devotion to you. And therefore Prahlad, Prahlad Maharaj is teaching us by this prayer that we are unable to become Krishna conscious. But if we seriously pray and follow the best we can, the instructions given to us, by that sincere prayer and that by that committed endeavor in Krishna consciousness, everything becomes successful. And that's required. The Lord wants us to pray. He wants us to see. He wants us to understand we, we can't do anything without His mercy. But we can do everything with His mercy. And that's the point. His mercy is the dividing point between complete devastation and complete triumphancy. In other words, his, his mercy will make everything different. And therefore we pray to the Lord as Prahlad Maharaj, please enter into our hearts and with your very powerful nails and teeth destroy that Harani Kashipu that's running around there. But he says it in a different way. He says, Fruit of desires in this material world inspire everyone in their activities to gain success in life. But these fruit of activities just entangle one more and more in the meshes of uh, attachment to this material world and divert our attention away from the real goal of life, which is to develop our relationship in bhakti and love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So these prayers by Prahlad Maharaj, they go, they go really deep in the essence of Krishna consciousness. He completely throws up his hands, I can't do anything, and you can do everything, it's your mercy, but this is my desire. So the strength of our success is the desire that we develop in wanting to become Krishna conscious. When we want nothing else but Krishna, and you can get Krishna. <laughs> That was a signal saying, yes, <laughs> whatever you want. When you, when you want nothing else but Krishna, then you can get Krishna. If you want something else, then Krishna is 
I'll wait <laughs> until you're ready. But Narada Sringadev, he accelerates the process. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he is a resident of the spiritual world. He is an eternal associate of Srimati Radharani. He's one of her intimate assistants in his service to her in the spiritual world. But what does he pray for? He prays to Lord Nishringadev. Why would someone in the mood of Madhurya Ras want to pray to Nishringadev who is in the Vaikuntha realm? What does he pray for? Please remove all of those obstacles that are blocking my path to pure devotional service to the divine couple in the spiritual world. That's what he prays for. Although he's coming to the Nishringadev to ask for removal of those obstacles that just divert our attention and block our path for success in devotion. And he also prays, my dear Lord, this material world is full of illusions. Maya means what is not. What does it mean what is not? My Prabhupada said Maya is a pure devotee, so how can you say Maya is not? What it means is that she's a magician. <laughs> she's the expert magician. She can create illusions that appear to be reality. And therefore the conditioned souls runs after these illusions in order to find happiness and satisfaction. And just like a magician, there's nothing there. It's just a lot of magic, that's all. So this material world is, is designed to attract the conditioned souls in such a way as to make them forget who they are and what is their actual goal of life. So he prays these illusions Please help me to understand that these are actually illusions and there's no substance to them. The real substance, the real goal is my love for Krishna, my service to Krishna. Bring me to that path. And these illusions just to divert my attention away. And sometimes I actually become attracted to these illusions. But then when I, after I get attracted and I try to find satisfaction in trying to fulfill my desires through these illusions, then I wake up and I realize it was just an illusion. So therefore, please, destroy those illusions. And then, of course, dangers. Padam padam ya vi padam. This material world is fraught with dangers. I mean, when you become a devotee, the Lord protects the devotee. And so we somehow don't experience the hard life that a materialist has, because we've been somewhat protected by the mercy of the Lord. But still, we have to be understanding that this world is what it is. It's meant to, to destroy you and defeat you. That's the purpose of this world. And what is the ultimate defeat? Whatever you gain in the end, you lose. Death says, all right, come with me. Well, can I take my family? No. Can I take my money? No. Can I take anything? No. <laughs> I don't want to go. You have no choice. <laughs> so, yeah, so this material world is meant to take everything away that you work so hard for. And that's just what it is. But for a devotee, it's different. It's different. What is that difference? is that the Lord protects his devotees against these cruel dangers and even death. I use the example of death. Why? Because death is, seems to be the ultimate defeat of everything. But a devotee doesn't die. Why? Because the devotee becomes transcendental to everything material. Why? Because they realize, hey, I'm not this body. I'm something different than this body. And therefore, when I actually leave this body, I go to a better place. If somebody says, here, here's a ticket for um, Dubrovnik <laughs> for vacation. <laughs> That's all I could think of in Croatia. <laughs> so, I guess there's other places that you would probably choose, but <laughs> That's the one I thought of. And you think, no, no, man, I want to work. I want to suffer and, oh. 
No, there's some nice boats waiting for you at the, the shore of the, this nice, you know, resort city, and you can enjoy. <laughs> no, no, no. So, but we understand that, you know, death means going to a higher realm of spiritual existence. So the devotees are not afraid of death. What are they afraid of? Wasting time. Mm. Time. 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 Powerful. Really powerful. Don't waste it. <laughs> Use every minute you can to become Krishna conscious. And then time becomes your friend. <laughs> time takes you to that realm where you really, really want to go back home, back to the spiritual world. Because we're not these bodies. And we can't, uh, we just keep coming back. Mitya Maya Vasa, Kachyo Beshe, Kachyo Be, Bhubu Bhubu Vai. Jeep Krishna Das, Hey Vishwas. Kolina Dukana, life after life, we take a body in Croatia and we, maybe we'll get a body in Kosovo. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, what else, uh, Albania? <laughs> what else, United States? Oh my God, that's horrible. <laughs> oh, that's the worst one you could possibly get. <laughs> You might wind up becoming, you know, you know a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> and they're worse than Republicans nowadays, anyway. <laughs> so, you know, you never know where you're going to go next. So use your time to get out of this material world. Therefore, taking shelter of Nishringadev and praying for his mercy to destroy. For the story goes, there was a very, very powerful personality. His name was Haranya Kashipu. Haranya means gold, Kashipu means soft bed or sex life. These are the things that the materialists chase after. As much money as they can possibly get and try to enjoy the opposite sex to their fullest extent. And that's what they do. Prabhupada said if there was no sex life in the material world, there'd be no material world. <laughs> That keeps the material world going. <laughs> really. <laughs> and so the materialists, they, they make sure it keeps going. <laughs> That's all they chase after. More money and more uh, so-called enjoyment from the opposite sex. But that's what Harani Kashipu actually means. And that's what he was just... And he wanted as much as that he, as he could get. So he performed austerity. And the posterities that Harani Kashifu performed were impossible for anybody to perform, even the greatest yogi. He stood on his tippy toes with his arms straight up in the air and just with his eyes focused on the sky. I don't know what he was praying, but he was, he was in this... And he was meditating on something within his heart, maybe the super soul. And he wanted to become powerful just by performing us. Because austerities make you powerful. If you want to become powerful, perform austerities. The materialists, they become powerful by doing it. Devotees become powerful. But powerful doesn't attract Krishna. Bhakti attracts Krishna. So you can become powerful but without bhakti, what is useless? <laughs> but when, you're ba when you have bhakti and austerity, then you become very powerful, spiritually. So Rani Kasipu, he had his arms straight up in the air, and he, was, uh, he became so immersed in his meditation, went on for 100 celestial years, absorbed, and what happened, he completely neglected anything about his body. He was completely outside of his body. He actually knew the yoga system. He was expert at, at pranayama and the yoga system. And he became so absorbed in that system 
that he was oblivious to what was happening to his body. Ants were gathering around him and they made big ants hills. So much so that his whole body was covered as an ant hill and they were eating away his flesh. But he still remained fixed. And then there was fire coming out of the top of the ant hill, which was his head, because by that austerity he was shooting flames into the sky. And the demigods were thinking, what's happening? This is, well, our planets are getting burnt. <laughs> so they called Brahma, Brahma, you have to do something. And Brahma came, and Brahma came on his swan airplane looking, and he couldn't find, and he saw something, some area where there's some smoke coming out. And he thought, oh, this must be it. So he came down closer. And then he saw what was happening. And then he, uh, he called, Harani Kashipu, Harani Kashipu, your austerities are perfect. I've come to give you a benediction. Ask anything you want from me. And this is what Harani Kashipu was waiting for. He thought Brahma was the actual Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he was worshipping Brahma, and therefore he said, I want to become immortal. Brahma said, I live for a long time and nobody is as, has life like me, but still I have to die. I'm not immortal. I can't give you what I, ha I don't have. <coughs> Ask for something else. But Harani Kashipu was fixed. He wanted to live forever so he could enjoy material life forever. So what did he do? He figured out ways that death can come. And he asked for a, a benediction not to be killed in that way. On land, sea, or air, by animal or man, by day or night, by any weapon. He thought of all the different ways that death could possibly come. And he kept asking him. Brahma said, Tatastu, granted. He kept granting him. And then when he was done, he thought, I'm immortal. <laughs> but then Krishna, you know, Krishna is always one step step ahead of even the most intelligent. So then he started ravaging the universes, and then he started... He was angry also because his brother, Hiranyaksha, was killed by Vishnu. So he wanted to take avenge against the devotees of Vishnu, so he started sending his, some of his assistants to go into the earth planet and burn the agricultural fields, kill cows, persecute and harass the Brahmins, and he was just causing havoc everywhere. Then he decided, I want to take over the heavenly planets. So he went to the heavenly planets and he challenged Indra. Indra realized he couldn't fight against him, so he ran from his throne. <laughs> and all the other demigods didn't know what to do. He, he sat on the throne of Indra and he said, I am your new Indra. <laughs> so you worship me. And they were fear, fearful of him. He, he, I mean, he had power and there was no question. His austerities were so strong that he became invincible. His body became like steel. You know, no weapon could even penetrate his body, what to speak about, you know, harming him. And that was Sarani Kashipu. But fortunately, the Lord showed him special mercy and arranged for him to have a particular son that was a very enlightened personality and that we know was Prahlad Maharaj. He had four sons, Lada, Anulada, and one more, and then Prahlad, four sons. But Prahlad was um, special. How was Prahlad born? How, was, how could a great soul be born to a body of a demon? Well, you might say, how about his wife? Well, his wife, she wasn't a devotee, but she wasn't a demon either. She was just a nice lady. <laughs> so one day, Harani Kasipu, after achieving so much power and rule, he decided he wanted more power. So he decided to go on vacation. His vacation was to perform more austerities. So <laughs> he went to some secluded place in one mountain, it's mentioned, and he started his meditation again. 
The demigods got really scared, and they, 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 they said, we have to stop him somehow. So Narada Muni became alerted, and Narada Muni changed his form into a bird. And when Harani Kashipu was doing his austerities, Narada Muni, in the form of a bird, was singing the glories of Vishnu. He would fly around him and sing the glories of Vishnu. And then Harani Kashipu would get angry and try to chase the bird away and try to go back to his austerities. And then every time he'd go back, you know, Narada, the bird, would come back and start, Vishnu, Vishnu. <laughs> and he couldn't do anything. So this kept going on and on. And all he kept hearing was the glories of Vishnu. After some time, he gave up his austerities, went home, had union with his wife, and there was a son born, Pallad. <laughs> so that's called the uh, Garbhadan Samskara of Harani Kashipu. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it's described. <laughs> he, 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 now he, Narada Muni prepared his consciousness for him. And then when that boy was born, of course, Harani Kashipu after that left, and then the demigods thought, oh no, in the womb of the, the wife of this demon is another demon coming, going to be born. So they took, they captured her. Her, her name was Kayadu. What was it? Kayadu? Yeah. And they took her to the, the boat of the demigods. And, but she was in distress. The Narada Muni found out, and he came. He said, what are you doing? This old lady is innocent. No, no, we, we don't have nothing against her. We're going to keep her here until she gives birth to the child, then we'll kill the child. He said, no, no. There's a great soul in the womb of this, this lady, and therefore I'm going to take possession. So he took the wife of Arani Kashipu to his own ashram, and although he's a great brahmachari, he <coughs> stayed with her until she actually gave birth. And while she was there, he kept preaching the glories of Vishnu, to her and giving her the whole science of bhakti yoga. She heard everything, but the, the child in the womb also heard. Very important for us devotees to know that ladies who are pregnant, whatever is going on in your life is also becoming, a, the child is also becoming affected. It's a very critical time to really develop the consciousness of the child the, during the, when the child is still in the womb. Therefore, we recommend the devotees either play kirtan or the read Krishna book or read some transcendental knowledge. And that way, when the child comes out, they have a nice start in life. Nice start in life. And so, and then, of course, the child was born. And when he was born, he was fully self-realized. He had already attained self-realization at the time of birth. <laughs> Powerful person. Some people, they actually say he was a Mahabhagavat. And as he grew up, you know, his father was saying, oh, he's my son, I should send him to school. You know, we send our kids to Gurukul, but this was Asurakul. <laughs> you know, the Suras have their program too. <laughs> So, and two of the teachers, they were sons of Sukracharya, Sanda and Namarka. They were the leaders of the teachers in the school, and they were the teachers of Pallad. And so, one day, Rani Kashipu calls to his teachers, bring my son. So they brought him, and he was very affectionate. He saw his son, he put his son in his lap, showed him all kinds of affection. He said, my dear Pallad. You are so wonderful. Please tell me what you have learned in school today. <laughs> and Prahlad said, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Bandanam, Dasam, Atmanivedanam, Sakyam, that these are the nine angas of devotional service and anyone who is actually intelligent will take to these processes of devotional service and go back home back to God. <laughs> And Parani Kashipu was, where did he get all this nonsense from? <laughs> he called the teachers, what are you teaching him? 
Uh, he's, to, he's, he's, he's glorifying my enemy, Vishnu. We're not teaching him anything. We don't know where he got it from. <laughs> oh, okay, take him back and deprogram him. <laughs> And give him the real knowledge, teach him how to be a demon, how to kill people, <laughs> how, to be, how to win office in political elections without having any, any popularity, <laughs> and how to stack the ballots against the, your opponent. <laughs> in other words, become a first-class cheater. <laughs> so they took him back and, Prahlad, Prahlad, where do you get all this knowledge from? Well, this knowledge is natural. <laughs> I heard it from my spiritual master, Narada Muni. And uh, they didn't believe it. Because <laughs> they said, he was so young, how can he hear all this knowledge? But he was so enlightened at such a young age that he was able to understand and process all this knowledge, even at such a young age. So they were trying to teach him, they were teaching that, you know, you want to be powerful, you have to destroy your enemies. And Prahlad Maharaj said, friends and enemies, these are concoctions of the mind. One day someone is our friend, the next day that same person is our enemy. So the mind creates friends and enemies, so there's no such thing. There's only, there's only Krishna is their only friend and there's no enemies. <laughs> so they couldn't do anything with him. They were trying to teach him, and he was just giving them the real, the reality. So another time, Palatsu Parani Kashibhu said to his son, or to the teachers, again, bring him back. He was hoping he was fully transformed into demonology. And so now he's asking again, Oh, Palat, Palat, Palat. I'll get to the verse here. And he said, uh, Yeah, only and the teachers came back and said, We can't do anything with him. After hearing the words from his teacher, he said, Oh, unqualified sons of a Brahmin, talking to the teachers, you have disobeyed my orders and taken shelter of the party of my enemy. You have taught this boy about devotional service. What is this nonsense? In due course of time, various types of diseases are manifested for those who are sinful. Simply in this world, there are many who are deceptive friends in the, na in the guise of um, deceptive in the, in the guise of false garb. Because of their false behavior, they actually become enmity towards one. So he's speaking to them. O oh, son of Sukharacharya, Hirani Kashipu, spiritual master, said, O oh, enemy of King Indra, whatever your son Prahlad has said has not been taught to him by me or anyone else. His spontaneous devotional service has naturally developed in him. Therefore, please give up your anger and do not unnecessarily accuse us. It is not good to insult a Brahmana in this way. <laughs> When Hari Kashipu received this reply from his teacher, he again addressed his son, You rascal, <laughs> you most fallen of our family, if you have not received this education from your teacher, where have you gotten it from? And Prahlad Maharaj said, My dear father, Asurya Bhajya, O oh best of the demons. <laughs> He loved his father and he gave him some credit. Not only are you a demon, but you're the best one. <laughs> because of their uncontrolled senses, persons too addicted to materialistic life make progress towards hellish conditions and repeatedly chew that which has already been chewed. Their inclinations towards Krishna are never aroused either by the instructions of others, by their own efforts, or by a combination of both. Persons who are strongly entrapped by the consciousness of enjoying material life and who therefore accept it as their leader or guru, a similar blind man attached to external sense objects, cannot understand the goal of life is to return home back to Godhead. He's speaking this to his father. <laughs> and engage in the service of Lord Vishnu. As blind men guided by another blind man miss the right path and fall into the ditch, 
materially attached men led by another and materially attached man are bound by the ropes of fruit of labor which are made of strong cords. And they continue again and again in materialist life, surrendering to the threefold miseries. And after telling his father what's going to happen to him <laughs> if he doesn't become Krishna conscious, then Pallad's compassionate, he says, unless they smear upon their bodies the dust of the lotus feet of a Vaishnava, completely freed from all material contaminations, persons very much inclined towards materialistic life cannot be attached to the lotus feet of the Lord, who is glorified by uncommon activities. Only by becoming Krishna conscious and taking shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord, in this way one can be freed from material contamination. After Pallad spoke, I mean, really, he was really trying to help his father. This is the point that's being made. He was concerned that he, he wanted to help his father get out of his illusion. He was serious. But, you know, Harni Kashipu couldn't hear anything. So, after Pallad spoke, then he became completely silent. Harani Pusi Kashipu becomes so angry, he got blinded in anger, and he starts, he's, he calls his assistants, take him away and kill him immediately. He's a disgrace to the family. If, the, if a body has a particular disease in a particular place, one should try to cure the disease, but if the disease is uncurable, one must cut that part of the body out so it doesn't destroy the whole body. He's, speak, he's speaking very good philosophy. <laughs> and then um, these demons came and they took him away. And then you can see the pictures. It's described very nicely how Prahlad Maharaj was subjected to so many different types of tortures. They were, they were tried to stab him with spears. The spears couldn't do anything. Then they tried throwing him in boiling oil. They were burning by the pot. The pot was so hot they couldn't even get close to him. But still, Prahlad was in the middle of the oil and he was completely free. His body wasn't even touched by the oil. They put him in a cage, in a cave full of serpents, venomous serpents, most deadly. And they just, the serpents didn't do anything, just sat there. <laughs> And they took him and threw him under stampeding elephants. The elephants went around him. Then they threw him off a mountain and Krishna caught him when he was falling down. <laughs> you can see the picture, Krishna's on the bottom and he's catching Prahlad. <laughs> and then nothing works, so he calls his brahmanas, his tantric brahmanas, and he says, use your evil spells and kill him with, with Tantric, left-handed Tantric. So they were ch chanting all these mantras and Pallad was just there. And the mantras were doing nothing. <laughs> they were completely ineffectual. And then what happens is that if you try to put a spell on someone, if you curse someone, and it doesn't work, that power, power person is too powerful, that spell has to go by someone, has to go somewhere if it's an effective mantra. And these Brahmins were expert. But what happened was, the curse that they were trying to kill him with was coming back to them, and they were dying. They were dying. And they said, Pallad, Pallad, we're dying, <laughs> save us. <laughs> and Pallad, I don't know, it mentions and Prahlad did something and then the curses stopped and they were freed from it. He didn't even have any anger, no enmity, no negativity towards the persons who were trying to kill him. He was just thinking they're an illusion. Prabhupada says, and he says it many times, especially in this particular pastime, a devotee has no enemy. A devotee has no enemy, he says, Someone will make a devotee their enemy, but a devotee doesn't make that same person their enemy. Because what is it about a person that we don't like? It's called the shadow of the person. 
when you find fault with another person, you're not finding fault with the person because the person is a pure spirit soul and therefore the soul has, is pure, it doesn't have any faults. You're finding fault with the body, which is the covering over the body. So it's used, it's like the analogy of grabbing onto a person's shadow and thinking that's the person. Clear? Let's see. So when we find fault with another person, we're just grabbing onto their shadow. It's not the real person. But apparently people do have faults, but that is due to their association with material energy. But the real person is the soul who never touches the material energy. So a devotee sees that, and therefore a devotee is compassionate towards others who may be even inimical towards them. That doesn't mean we allow people to take advantage of us. That's another thing. And this is also a very powerful statement. If someone wants to cause harm to you and you don't stop them, then you are just as guilty as they are for the harm that's being caused to you. You should never allow anyone to do any harm to you if you can prevent it. Because it's bad for them and it's bad for you. But at the same time, we don't, we, we don't hold enmity towards anyone. That is the Krishna Consciousness principle. So they tried everything. They brought him back to Rani Kashipu. Uh, we failed. <laughs> we couldn't do anything. So then Rani Kashipu, he decided, so let's mention he took Prahlad and threw him in the ocean and threw a mountain on top of him. But that didn't work. Nothing could kill him. And you might think, is this some kind of like, you know, some story? No, it's not. Krishna is Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Satcharachara. Krishna has complete and perfect control of every aspect of the material energy at all times, either directly or indirectly. The material energy cannot work without his sanction. But he puts it in progress and it works according to his desire. But if he wants to change how the material energy works, then he can do that. And Prabhupada said, he can make day, night, and night day. And Krishna is so powerful. You can't conceive of how is that, what does that mean? <laughs> you can't even figure out what does it mean to make day, night, and day, and night, day. I could guess at it. It means like you'd sleep during the day and work during the night. <laughs> That's the only guess I could come up with. But anyway, in other words, Krishna is all-powerful. He has, he has complete control, complete power, and he's omniscient. He knows everything at all times, in all places with all, into all living entities. That's Krishna. So, when he wants to protect the devotee, no matter how dangerous the devotee is put into a situation, nothing can harm that devotee. Rake Krishna Mori Ke. Mori Krishna Rake Ke. If Krishna wants to protect you, there is nothing anywhere that can harm you. And if Krishna loses, give, doesn't give you protection, you're a god. You can't, you can't save yourself. There's nothing. So that, the devotee knows that, yes, the, that I take shelter of Krishna, he will give me protection. And that's one of the symptoms of being a devotee, to know that Krishna will give the devotee full and complete protection. But we have to take shelter. We have to ask for his protection. We have to seek that protection. But still, even sometimes when we don't do that, Krishna still gives protection. That's Krishna. <laughs> and so, Rani Kasipu couldn't do anything. Finally, he said, Prahlad. And he started to think. I mean, he actually said, and I'm trying to kill this boy, and he's so powerful. Maybe I'll die. <laughs> but maybe not. And then he turned to be an affectionate father again. He put Prahlad on his lap and he said, Prahlad, where do you get your powerful, power from? 
And Pallad immediately answered, I get my power from from the same place everybody gets their power from. I get the same place you get your power from, from Vishnu. <laughs> so that's the last thing you wanted to hear. And Harani Kasipu said, my power is my power. <laughs> <laughs> And arrogance and ignorance. When there's arrogance and there's knowledge, that's not so bad. In other words, if you're great and you're arrogant, I mean, it's not so good. <laughs> but if you're a fool and you're arrogant, whoo, <laughs> that's worse. <laughs> I mean, don't be arrogant in any case, but anyway. <laughs> So that point is being made here that Varani Kashipu couldn't conceive that there was any other power outside of him. And then he said, where is your Vishnu? Is he here? Is he here? Is he here? And he kept going different ways trying to indicate, is Vishnu here? And then finally he turned to this pillar. Mm, wrong chapter. <laughs> he turned to the pillar. And he saw, is he in this pillar? And Prahlad said, yes, my father, he's in the pillar. And Harani Kasipu, he became cursing again and again. He took up his sword and with tremendous power and anger, he smashed the sword against the pillar. And all of a sudden, the whole universe started to shake. Uh, the demigods thought, uh-oh, -uh, we're all finished now. <laughs> And out of the pillar, said, so then from within the pillar, a fearful sound came, which appeared to crack the covering of the universe. The sound reached even the abode of the demigods, like Brahma. And then the demigods heard, and they thought, oh no, now our planets are being destroyed. While showering his extraordinary, by showing his extraordinary power, Rani Kashipu, who desired to kill his son, heard that wonderful, tumultuous sound which had never been heard before. Upon hearing the sound, the other leaders of the demigods were, demons were afraid. None of them could find the origin of that sound in the assembly. To prove the statement of his servant, Prahlad Maharaj, was substantial. In other words, to prove that the Supreme Lord is present everywhere, even within the pillar of the assembly hall, the Supreme Personality of God exhibited a form that was never seen before. The form was neither that of a man nor a lion. And then the Lord appeared in his wonderful form in the assembly hall. When Rani Kasipu saw, he was looking at this form. He said, the demigods have created this to kill me, but it's not possible. <laughs> he couldn't figure out what it was. So then he decided to attack, and he attacked. And he was swinging his sword, and the Lord was just pushing him away and playing with him for a while. And Harani Kashipu was becoming defeated. Every time he tried to, the Lord would just take him and throw him. <laughs> and he got so fearful of the Lord that he started to fight with the Lord with his eyes closed. He couldn't look at Nisringadeva because Nisringadeva was really angry. And he was going to give him a little bit of a f fun, you know, a little suffering before he decided to complete the operation. And so at one point then he just said, time's up. <laughs> and he took the demon, put him on his lap and went, It was much worse than that. <laughs> that was just like a mouse making noise. <laughs> I'm just getting rid of my frustration. So. <laughs> you know, in sannyasi, it's tough life, you know. <laughs> No, no sense gratification. <laughs> so, yeah, so, and then, and then he ripped apart and he took his heart and 
threw it. Successful Harper operation. The patient died. <laughs> And then he took the garland, no, the intestines of Harani Kashipu, and the Lord put it around his neck as a garland. Why did he do that? It sounds quite messy, doesn't it? <laughs> but what he wanted to show is that he wanted to give Harani Kashipu the benefit of doing some seva. Because that was his, that's his, his eternal associate from the spiritual world, Jai appeared, to the, to these demons appeared, they, they were fallen gatekeepers in the spiritual world, Jai and Vijay. So in order to honor his devotee, the Lord actually took the intestines and wore it as a garland. How kind the Lord is. And then, you know, he took the body of Harani Kushipu and he just threw it. And then all of the demons' friend, they started to charge the Lord, and there's a big fight, and you can see the Lord manifested 16 arms. There's many beautiful pictures how he was just wiping out the demons. There was hundreds and thousands of demons just chasing it. And the Lord was just making, you know, you know the statistics were, were worse than COVID. <laughs> it was just... You know, just ripping them, all these demons apart, and they were just flying in different directions. Few, few, there was a few left, and he decided to go and take the vaccination. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that were left. <laughs> and so then the Lord was so angry, and he was still angry. All the demons were killed, Ranikashi Pu was killed, but the Lord was still ferocious. And now the demigods, when they saw what was happening, they realized it was the Supreme Lord, but nobody could approach the Lord. His, his anger was so frightening. And he was angry because his pure devotee was actually being harassed. And so Brahma, he goes to Lakshmi, she's also there. The demigods and the ladies came. They all wanted to meet the Lord. But nobody could go up and approach the Lord. So he said to Lakshmi, Lakshmi, that's your husband. <laughs> go pacify him. She said, I don't know that one as my husband. <laughs> He's not my husband. I'm a chaste lady. Dai shishi gorna tai gijai. And so Lakshmi wouldn't go. She wouldn't go. And none of the demigods could go either. So then um, Brahma came to Prahlad and said, he's come because of you. <laughs> so you should pacify him. Okay, so Prahlad, very, they, they gave a garland to Prahlad and Prahlad started walking. And he came right to the feet of the Lord. The Lord was big, he was huge. And when he saw his little devotee standing there with this garland, ready to garland him, the Lord became completely calm. And he saw it, and the Lord actually started to show affection. And then Prahlad climbed on his lap, and the Lord offered him a garland, and it was very sweet. We worship the Lord in Vatsayuras. Nusringadeva is worshipped as the parent. He is the ultimate and supreme parent of the devotee. He gives complete protection, complete affection also. He's very affectionate to his devotees. There's a beautiful verse that says, just as a, the cub of a lion, a lioness, her baby cub is very, she's very affectionate to her baby cub. But to others, she's like death personified. <laughs> so that's a nice description of how the Lord is always so kind and affectionate to his devotees, but uh, for the demons, he's death personified. So the Lord was so happy, and then finally, the Lord said to Prahlad, Prahlad, you have worshipped me so nicely. Your love for me is perfect. Please take a benediction. Prahlad said, My dear Lord, I don't worship you for any, anything. 
I simply worship you out of love. But the Lord didn't give up. He said, please take a benediction, ask anything. And Prahlad said, I'm not a merchant, but since you're asking me and I can see you want to give me something, then please give my father liberation. It's the first thing he asked for. He simply prayed that his father would get liberation. And uh, the Lord said, you don't even have to ask. It's already done. <laughs> ask something else. And so Prahlad was realizing the Lord is not going to leave me alone unless I <laughs> ask for something. And he said, my dear Lord, if you really want to give me a benediction, then please let me stay in this material world and preach to these non-devotees, these materialists who have made a humbug civilization out of this place. I am feeling compassion for them. Please let me stay and be your instrument to show mercy to these persons. That's what he asked. When the Lord heard that, he realized. <laughs> the Lord's heart just melted when he heard Prahlad Maharaj didn't even ask for liberation, he didn't ask for anything. He just wanted to stay in the material world and preach to the, the fallen conditioned souls. And so when the Lord heard that, he, he there was nothing else he could say. And then he granted that benediction, actually. He granted that benediction. So the Lord is very merciful, he's very kind, he's very available. There are, even in our present day civilization, so in our society, so many devotees, and I use the word so many, have had personal darshans of Lord Nishringadev. I'm sure it's even a few of you here had some experience with Lord Nishringadev. He's very personal, and because of this age is so dangerous. Um, just like, there's a whole book written about the different pastimes that many devotees had with Lord Nishringadev, especially from Mayapur. Really beautiful stories. There's one story that's little known, little, yeah. There was one gentleman, he was elderly, and he was in the hospital, and his relatives came to see him. And his, his grandson was a devotee. So he was preaching to his grandfather that, you know, you should actually, now you're your life is coming to an end, you should actually worship the Lord, become a devotee of, the, of Krishna, and you should chant this mantra, and he taught him how to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. So he listened to his grandson preaching to him, and then everything was over, and they went, they left, and he forgot about what he told him. And so when he's in the hospital a couple more days, and then one day, he's laying in his hospital bed, he looks towards the door, and he sees this creature standing, a half man, half lion, standing by the door, this grandfather. And his eyes get big, and then Nishringadev spoke to him. He said, chant that prayer your grandson told you, and then he left. <laughs> And then it was really, I mean, it made the difference. <laughs> and he started chanting Hare Krishna, and the next day he died. <laughs> Amazing how merciful Lord Nishringadev was. So many nice stories of Lord Nishringadev. There's that one story that one brahmachari was worshipping Lord Nishringadev in Mayapur. And he was always afraid of Lord Nishringadev. <laughs> So one day after he had finished the worship, he went to take rest in the ashram. And they're sleeping on these bunk beds, so he was on the top. And, you know, it's getting on, it's getting towards the morning hours, and he feels the whole bed is shaking. So it's waking him up, and he's thinking it must be the devotee in the bottom getting up. But then the shaking is getting more, so he, he gets up and he looks, and Lord Nishringadev is sitting on the edge of his bed the same deity he was worshipping. And immediately Lord Nishringadev took his hand and put him on his shoulder. 
he described it was like the universe, the weight of the universe was placed upon my shoulder. And Lord Nisringadev looked at him and said, why are you afraid of me? Don't be afraid. And then he said, Ann, uh, when you wake me up, don't shine that light in my eyes. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> And this brahmachari really freaked out. I mean, I mean, he went nut bonkers. He jumped off his bed and started running, and he ran into the temple, and he's just and he's saying, you know, the Shringadi. And then the devotee, people were in the temple, it was early, well, not too many people, and they were looking at him, what's wrong? And they saw he, he, he forgot to get dressed, you know. <laughs> he was running around in his copans. <laughs> he had forgotten to get dressed. <laughs> And then later on he told the whole story. <laughs> ah, a special mercy. Yeah, so... Uh, and there's many stories of the, how devotees were protected by Nisringadev. There's so many stories, but... We, do, we don't want to go too late, because tomorrow is uh, another day, and many of you have to get up early. So we'll finish the evening. And we can chant that one verse again. It's very powerful. If you chant this verse, you will become fearless. Shri na shringha jai na shringha jai jai Shri na shringha Palada desha jai apadma muka padma bringam Ugram virya mahavishnu Jwalantam sarvatomukam Nusringa Bishinam Badram Mitya Mityam Namamiyaham Sri Nasringa Jai Nasringa Jai Jai Nasringa Dev Jaya Padma Mukha Padma Bringam Ugram Virya Mahavishnu Jwalantam Sarvatomukham Nusringa Vishinam Bhadram Mitya Mityam Namamiyam Sri Nusringa Bhagavan Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Dila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Questions? Okay. Question? We have questions. Okay. <laughs> Was it work? Okay. Hmm. First is um, regarding residence of Lord Sivad because. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned about a lot of food. Pray towards here, the, you know, uh, yeah, and uh, as far as I remember, I'm just sure that Rupa Goswami, because he's a lot of about Tamil talks out there, he said that Bolt, that not Bolt, but that Nishinga, that Krishna, Rama, Chaitanya, and Resinha are in a special category. Rama, Chaitanya, and Nishinga. Mm -hmm. One person, yeah, just one person in different. So I'm wonder, wondering, is it really the same that by Punta, uh, like expansion, like other Narayana? He's a he's a Narayan incarnation. That's that's confirmed in the Shastras. But in its age, he's especially petitioned to help the devotees on their path back to Goloka Vrindavan by clearing away the obstacles. Mm -hmm. So he assists the devotees in that, and that's his, that's his service. So those who who are worshipping Radha and Krishna, if you're Radha and Krishna is your Istadev, we can still pray to Nisringadev. And it's not contrary to the, to the type of worship. Because you said in this age, and Prabhu Maharaj, Long ago, and he was actually in Bhagavatam, he's Krishna Bhakta, he's not in Siddha Bhakta. Right, right. That's true. 
you always pray to Krishna, actually. Right. So I'm, I'm connecting this. I mean, the Siva Dev is really, in a sense, you know, he's not, of course, he's not on going to the land. Right. Know, but maybe he's not like any other uh, way of He's unique. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he is in the category of a of himself, he's in his own category. But we can have prayed in the Sringadev for protection, for destruction of illusions, for being freed from fruit of results, and for removing obstacles in our devotional path. And he's inclined to these, he likes to serve his devotees when his devotees sincerely pray. So I, I, if you're looking for the, the tattva, he's definitely Vaikuntha. Okay. And the second is uh, actually, we, you mentioned the rasa that we see that they have toward Pralad. Yeah. But since Pralad came to him so naturally without any fear, according to Tower we see that in the Sakya rasa or, or Dasa? No, actually, Rupa Goswami makes, he mentions the different manifestations of the, the forms of the Lord, and he gives a particular emphasis on a particular rasa for each one. And for Nishringa Devi, he says, Vatsaya Ras. Vatsaya, parental affection. Yes, uh, which one has uh, a lot? That was my question. What is Pallad's relationship with the Shringadev? Yeah, because he so fearlessly came to him like friend, you know, in a oh. sense, not like us, yeah, that he was fearful. Or right, yeah. He, he, he could see that's the same deity that I worship all the time, but he's a different form, that's all. He, as you mentioned, which is correct, that he was worshipping Krishna. He's a devotee of Krishna. But Krishna came in that form. As Nishingadev. Because there was the benedictions of Brahma to fulfill. So the Lord wanted to keep the benedictions of Brahma and at the same time kill the demon. Krishna, in the Krishna form, he couldn't do that. That form is not made for that type of, that, that type of appearance. So he appeared in that form which was designed to fulfill the benedictions of Brahma and to kill the demon at the same time. And it's also mentioned that, uh, let's see, hmm, I, had, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh yeah, Prahlad Maharaj, how did he get that, it is the story of his previous life, maybe you're, you're probably aware of that story. He was with a prostitute. And uh, they had a big argument, and they they fought, and they didn't talk to each other after the argument. And that person who was Prahlad in a previous life fasted, and he happened to fast on Lord Nishringadev's appearance day. <laughs> that was Lord Nishringadev's appearance day where he had that fight with the prostitute and fasted. So there's, there's that connection too, and that story is connected to his... That's mentioned also. Yeah, Lakshmi Nishringa. What is? Can you explain? Yeah, well, Nishringa Dev has he he has nine forms. Yeah, from very peaceful to very ferocious. So, you're asking which form you should worship? <laughs> well, you're a sannyasini, right? So, you don't have to worry. <laughs> but those in Grihastha life should not worship Uber Nishringa, because it destroys your marriage. Unless you really want to get out of the marriage. <laughs> I see some people are getting their eyebrows around. 
here's a here's a real devotional here's a real devotional way to get out, get out of the money. <laughs> but I mean, I talked to one of the best pujaris ever in Iskon. He was, you know, I mean, he was a, he was a yagya master. He told me, he said, I worshipped Nishringadev and he ruined my marriage. <laughs> And then twice in the same year, within a few months, two different Grihasta couples came to me with their Uga Nishringa Didi and said, he's ruining our, our marriage here, take him. <laughs> I gained two Nishringa, that, this was the one we worshipped tonight, that was, one, that was given to me by a Grihasta couple. Yeah. So yeah, but for, for Grihastas, it's recommended to worship Lakshmi Nishringa. Because when Lakshmi is there, everything is auspicious. The home becomes what we say plentiful. There's never any scarcity in the home when Lakshmi is there. So you can worship Lakshmi and the Sringa deities in your on your altar like that, but not Ugra. <laughs> but he has eight form, nine forms from from very peaceful to very ferocious. When he comes out of the pillar. That's the most ferocious form. He only sees one thing. Ranikashipu. So yeah, so we can we can worship, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, uh, I can't see who that is. Oh, Ayodhya Dev. Okay, Hare Krishna. Your fulgence was blocking my ability to see you. <laughs> I would ask, I would like to ask you, uh, if somebody attacked uh, some devotee, uh, in what moment the uh, devotee must try to do something to defense, and in what moment you just surrender to God and uh, ask protection? I think it's, well, Prabhupada, he talks about that. How when he came to New York City, devotees were telling him that when people are attacked on the streets, nobody will do anything. Prabhupada said, he said, Prabhupada was talking in a general sense, and he said that, you know, if you see someone is being attacked, he, it's, he said it's just natural to come to, to do something to help that person. He said it's natural, it's human nature. But he didn't tell us anything more than that. He said, so you have to recognize the circumstance. And you have to discriminate between what is right and what is, what is wrong. It's not so easy to just to give an answer. But usually if you see someone who's being innocently persecuted, it's just natural you want to come to their rescue in some way. It's just, just human nature. Is that an echo? <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question from Ishwar Puri Prabhu. Because. What is our foolishness? What is our foolishness? Yeah. Example, I can say that uh, I am divorced because Ura Neshimhade destroyed my marriage. And yeah, I, I, thank, you for, thank you for allowing me so to be... It should be <laughs> not like that. I think that many of us uh, did it ourselves. If Ura Neshimhade did it, then it would be a great blessing for us. But, uh, so the question is how to understand where is this uh, 
If you see your marriage being destroyed, you can stop it. <laughs> but if you don't stop it, that means it's another reason. You know, just like I mentioned, two Grihasta couples, within a few months, both presented their deities to me and saying, this is what's happening to our marriage here, please take our deities. And I, you know, I graciously accepted the deities. But their marriages continued on. But if you see that's happening, and we're going to sing his theirs in your house, then you should know that this is one of the reasons. He can only be worshipped by strict brahmacharis or sannyasis, not by grihastas. It's just the way it is. So, since I'm a good boy, that was the last question. <laughs> I try to be. But thank you very much. A very special day today, so take advantage of it. And uh, uh, remember Lord Nisringade, pray to him. He's our, good, he's our best friend, and he's always there to... Uh, of course, we honor him for who he is, but at the same time we know that with both his mercy of protection, then we have complete protection. Thank you very much. Shringa Bhagavan Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.